Welcome to this episode of the Business of Practice podcast, where we focus on the fiscal, financial, and human sides of equine veterinary medicine. In this episode, we are talking about pandemic relief for veterinarians with Dr. Marsha Heinke. I'm your host, Kim Brown, editor of Equimanagement. The Business of Practice podcast is brought to you by Decra Veterinary Products. Dr. Marsha Heinke is a 1979 graduate of The Ohio State University. She was a full-time mixed animal practitioner for 14 years with special interests in companion animals and horses before she turned her attention to helping veterinarians in business. Dr. Heinke is an enrolled agent with the IRS, a certified public accountant, and a certified veterinary practice manager. Dr. Heinke is the author of Practice Made Perfect, a complete guide to veterinary practice management. Thank you, Dr. Heinke, for joining us today to talk about pandemic relief for veterinarians. Kim, thank you so much for having me on the show today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with my colleagues. And uh, we talked a bit about some of the areas of law changes that we can discuss today. It's been a very uh, confusing and complicated time because of the impacts of the coronavirus and all the things that that means for running a veterinary hospital. But rather than talk about the actual disease impacts on how we manage our staff, which would be a whole nother topic of of discussion, I'd like to focus on, uh, to begin with, uh, some of the provisions that were offered through the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 that was signed into law on December 27th, uh, just passed, that provides some clarity as to what was intended by the CARES Act that passed late in March of 2020 to address the financial shoring up of small businesses. Many in the veterinary profession took on paycheck protection program loans, sometimes called triple P loans or PPP loans. And uh, many, many uh, of our clients, many veterinarians that I know of, who are running practices decided that there was a there was quite a bit of uncertainty in how this was going to play out and impact revenues, employee uh, compensation, uh, sustenance, and a whole slew of other things that it was very reasonable to take on these loans. We've been very fortunate in the veterinary profession, just as an aside, to say that as a whole. Uh, we have done quite well during what has been extremely financial traumatic for many in our communities. And so uh, I I just hope that everybody's counting their blessings as to how um, fortunate we are as doctors of veterinary medicine running veterinary practices to be in the situation that we're at where many practices have actually seen revenue increases, albeit maybe not that great, but Um, actually had revenue increases in 2020 as compared to 2019. Now, what this recent act did was provide final clarity as to Congress's intention in the CARES Act with the PPP loans. The PPP loans, as originally designed, were intended to provide money from the SBA through lending banks that would then flow to small businesses that made application attesting to need. And Congress had intended that those loan proceeds, as long as they were used for designated expenses, primarily payroll in veterinary practices, that those loan proceeds would not be taxed. And um, what happened then was at the end of April, The Internal Revenue Service, under the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, stated uh, through one of their releases that the expenses that the loan would be used to pay, primarily payroll expenses, but also designated rent, uh, utilities, and um, uh, certain mortgage interest expense, that those designated expenses if if used to obtain forgiveness of the SBA provided loans would not be deductible. So to to give an example, if I applied for and obtained a $100,000 loan, which was uh, pretty close to the average loan amount, and um, I then used 100% of that loan for 
payroll purposes that enabled forgiveness of the loan, the expenses that I had incurred for payroll would no longer be deductible against my normal operating income. This creates phantom income for small businesses that have done okay, because as we've had income coming in from our clients and use that to pay for expenses, which are on our books, regardless of whether you know we actually tap dollar for dollar the loan funds or not, uh, what the IRS was saying was that, okay, you had $100,000 of payroll expense that you applied for forgiveness, that expense is no longer deductible against the loan proceeds. So even though the loan proceeds themselves weren't taxable, the deductions were disallowed, which resulted in the exact same final conclusion that we've got taxable income. Now, what was really horrific about that for us as accountants is uh, my, my colleague here started doing calculations. And because of that additional income enabled by forgiveness, we were seeing that most of our veterinary clients were going to have tax hits of 40 to 50 percent of the loan proceeds amount um, once everything was taken into consideration. And there are some different interactions there, but one of them would have been um, eliminating for some of our clients the uh, deductions that were availed through the Tax Cuts and Job Act through the Qualified Business Income Deduction uh, that was signed into law uh, four years ago. So the, 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 mis the mismatch of all of these different things would have basically caused a great deal of tax for um, many of our clients. Now, granted, you know, you get in two dollars of loan and you pay out a dollar in taxes on that loan. You still had a dollar of of tax free income, if you will, that came in. But even so, it defeated the purpose. And this meant that small business owners are going to come up, have to come up with money to pay those taxes rather than use it for organizational needs as we continue to struggle with the pandemic, still don't know what all the ramifications are going to be. So this was a terrific win through the Consolidated, Consolidated Appropriations Act of December 27th that stated absolutely that these expenses are deductible, uh, that veterinarians will not have this tax hit. So this was a major win. And as I've told many of my veterinary colleagues, I really appreciate everybody that wrote their Congress people and said this needs to be passed uh, because it was that hue and cry uh, from many organizations and individual taxpayers that resulted in this being passed into law. The other good thing that happened with the, with the Consolidated Appropriations Act was that uh, it also clarified that the grants that came from the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program which many veterinarians applied for at the same time, allowing up to $1,000 per employee, up to $10,000 total grant, also are um, not taxable. And for so, you know, the to-do item here, Kim, for veterinarians is that if they already applied for forgiveness of their PPP loans during that process, SBA guidance said that you had to reduce the forgiveness portion by whatever idle grant you received. That means that anybody that did get an idle grant did apply for forgiveness, you probably have left money on the table. So for example, if I took that $100,000 loan, I had all my payroll expenses that validated forgiveness, I applied for it, say, early December of last year, uh, and I also had a $10,000 idle grant on the books, I would have had to reduce my loan forgiveness amount by $10,000, which means I asked for $90,000 to be forgiven, which means I owe $10,000 back to my lending bank, either you know as immediate lump sum payment or paid over time at 1% interest. Well, now we know because of the passage of this act, that those of you that did that can go back to your lending bank. I think that's where you're going to need to go and ask them, how do you get that idle loan amount reinstated and have the entire amount uh, forgiven? So um, asking, you know, go to your bank. That's probably a start, starting point is whatever loan officer that you were dealing with is try to find out how you might get that money back. 
Now, many people did not ask for forgiveness. That's been our recommendation right along because there was so much that was unknown. And we didn't know if Congress was going to pass uh, or enact uh, the uh, forgiveness um, um, portion that we were hoping for to state that these expenses were deductible. And unfortunately, it came so late in the year, it was very difficult to do tax planning around it. Therefore, we were telling people, you know, it might be best just to wait and see what comes out of this. The third thing that came uh, of benefit, out of many benefits in this in this Consolidation Act, is the uh, SBA being directed by Congress within 30 days to clean up its simplification process or to simplify the process for obtaining forgiveness. And I've not had a chance to review this law yet, but those of you that did wait to to petition for forgiveness need to know that. Um, that information will be forthcoming very shortly through new guidelines from the uh, SBA on loans that were less than $150,000. That makes it very easy to um, ask for forgiveness and get that run through. Um, all employers that took this loan do need to be aware that regardless of the simplification uh, process uh, for, for requesting forgiveness, is that you still have to have the documentation in the hopper, keep it in your files for six years. Uh, you need to have that information in the event there's ever an audit of the expenses that were used to petition for forgiveness and all of the other documentation that went around these loans. DECRA Veterinary Products is proud to sponsor Equimanagement's The Business of Practice podcast. DECRA's equine product line includes OSFOS, Clotinate Injection, Orthocon Vet IRAP 10 and 60, Osteocon PRP, Equidone Gel, Thumperidone, the Vetivex line of parenteral fluids, Phycox EQ Joint Supplement, and a comprehensive line of topical dermatologic products. The recent addition of Zymeta, Diaperone Injection, further expands Decra's equine offerings. For more information about Decra's products, please visit decra-us.com. I think my fourth piece of advice too here would be that you uh, look very carefully this year at maintaining your corporate minutes. Think about um, uh, documenting those with the assistance of your uh, company attorney. And uh, if, if nothing else is to just to document the fact that you did obtain a loan and the reasons for obtaining that loan at the point that you did, if you haven't already documented that many of uh, many veterinarians, I believe, um, worked on getting minutes drafted at the point that they um, decided to apply for a loan back in March and April. And um, so hopefully you have some formalized signed minutes that have been executed and are in the file. If you haven't done that, now's a good time to do it. Make sure that you've got all of the, the reasons for why you obtained those loans back at the point that you did. Remember, when you signed for the loan, you were certifying under penalty of fraud and perjury that you were uh, you had economic need and you had reasons for uh, looking to obtain those loans. And I think everybody can document the, the uncertainty that existed at the time as to how the pandemic would play out and impact their uh, individual business situation. And there are many veterinary practices that were adversely of, uh, impacted when business shutdowns went down. And uh, you can think about it, all the different reasons as to why you might have applied for a loan so um, moving on from that, Kim, I, I just wanted to touch on a, a little bit of discussion of some other things that were in the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act. One is an extension of a provision offered in the CARES Act that has to do with uh, Code Section 127 of the Internal Revenue Code. And uh, the CARES Act provided that in 2020, employers could make contributions of up to $5,250 per employee towards eligible education expenses, including student loan forgiveness without, and this was huge, without raising the employee's gross taxable income. So essentially you as an employer could pay your employee directly or pay the, the loan uh, provider, uh, you know, you've got a couple options here, uh, money to satisfy student loans. So for those of you that have, I think everybody does, has veterinary associates 
or 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 even as veterinary owners still have their own loans that are out out there is to be looking at the provisions of this and thinking about how those contribute how a contribution to loan um, retirement could could be made. So up to five thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. And the good part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act is that 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 uh, Section one twenty seven provision was extended through 2025. So it, the CARES Act just made it a one year deal. Now it is uh, going through 2025. So here's an opportunity to be fairly competitive in some things that you could do for associate veterinarians as you're looking to make hires over the next several years. Really a uh, uh, very valuable thing. The employer is able to deduct the amount and the employee does not have to include the amount that the employer pays in taxable income. So it's not subject to Social Security, to Medicare taxation. It's not subject to income taxes. Um, I don't know how the individual states are going to play this out and you know whether they will stay coupled to federal law or whether they will decouple and make this a taxable event under state income tax law. That's something that you'll need to follow through with your individual accountants uh, to ascertain uh, how, how that's managed. But it's a really good provision and one of those benefits that can be offered that is, that is quite nice. Um, the other uh, possible um, benefit option that I wanted to talk about, and there's there's a lot that that's sitting out there in terms of ways that we can alter benef alter benefits and be competitive in the workplace. But I wanted to specifically talk about the uh, Secure Act. The Secure Act got lost in the dust of the pandemic. It was passed uh, back on December nineteenth, two thousand nineteen, so over a year ago. And um, the SECURE Act was the, the abbreviation for setting up every community for retirement enhancement. And uh, I think some of the older listeners here are probably aware of that act because it affected things like deferring required minimum distributions from IRAs and retirement funds for those of us that are getting close to retirement or actually into our retirement years. But um, it also brought in, there's a lot in that act that's worth talking with your financial planners about. But one of the things that's in there that was brand new was the idea of the multiple employer 401k plan. And what this provides is that small employers can group together and um, obtain 401k K plans for their businesses in a in an affordable manner and one of the things that you know so many small employers veterinary hospitals included have not been able to do is implement much more than simple plans or the uh, the uh, individual um, in retirement plans for employees uh, under the simple provisions and every time you know we looked at 401k for our clients we found that they were just out of reach in terms of the cost there's a lot more that's involved in compliance with these plans. Uh, you have to carry an insurance bond. You have to uh, satisfy annual form uh, 5500 filing. And all of these things mean these plans cost anywhere from $7,000 to $10,000 a year for most employers to manage. And that puts them out of reach in terms of being able to be an affordable benefit. Now with the multiple employer plans or what's called sometimes called pooled employer plans or PEPs or MEPs, uh, we have an opportunity for veterinarians to, um, uh, be, to, to step up the game a little bit in terms of an, employ, uh, an employee retirement option by adopting a 401k plan through a MEP. The um, AVMA rolled out, uh, the AVMA Life uh, Trust rolled out a MEP uh, in uh, early October of last year. The first year that these MEPs uh, are available to employers is for the 2021 year. So any of you that um, are, are, are thinking about this should, should start to look into it. Some of you already have. Um, a veterinarian alerted me to the fact just a couple days ago that 
if you are adopting a 401k for the 2021 year, is that you want to be very careful not to put even one dollar of funding into a simple plan or other retirement um, option that you have available. So um, just a, a word of warning, be very careful. If you're thinking about 2021, getting a plan going, you definitely want to stop any simple plan funding that you're doing right now until you can get a conclusion as to what you want to do. Uh, but uh, we've been looking into the, the AVMA map and it looks to be very affordable. Uh, it, there's a lot of, of um, uh, safety uh, that's been in risk management that's been put into this in terms of the administration of the plan. And uh, so I, I recommend it as something that people want to look into as being able to uh, expand their, their, their benefit offering. And uh, you can go out to the AVMA website to get more information on that. Uh, and uh, the uh, people that are administering the plan, uh, the, the plan uh, TAG, T-A-G, has been very responsive and easy to work with from what I've seen thus far. So those are a couple of good things that are um, hitting right now for uh, the 2021 year, certainly on the 401k. If you uh, don't want to do that this year, or if you've already started funding your simple plan with the first payroll now uh, just upon us, for the uh, 2021 year, uh, start looking into it as a plan for the uh, two, uh, 2022 year and thinking about maybe this would be a good fit for your organization. So Kim, do you have any uh, questions or thoughts that before we uh, adjourn? I'll tell you what I think is that's a half dozen things that can either save veterinarians money or make them more competitive in today's industry when there's fewer young vets looking for jobs. So. We thank you very much, Dr. Heinke, for, for helping us out uh, to understand these. And I know there's a lot more involved, and I know veterinarians should talk to their own CPAs and attorneys about some of these. But we appreciate you coming in here, and we do want to state that this she is not offering legal or tax advice from her comments on this podcast. These are just general statements of what she has learned, so you need to talk to your own advisors about this. This is not meant to replace that. But some good tips in here on things you do need to take up with your own advisors. So we're going to sign off here, and we want to thank our audience for joining us for the Business of Practice podcast, and a big thanks to our sponsor, Decra Veterinary Products. Please visit equimanagement.com or your favorite podcast network, such as iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher, to hear each episode of The Business of Practice. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can send me an email at kbrown, that's the letter K Brown, at aimmedia.com. The Business of Practice podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network.